Good morning. I want to welcome you to Trinity Evangelical today. If you are a guest with us, a special welcome to you this morning. Thank you for coming to worship with us today. Worship the same God, but when we worship together as a family... Be standing off, stand over here. When... There we go. When we worship together as a family, we don't mind mistakes when they happen because we know that's the way a family is. Sometimes things don't go as planned. But a special welcome to you if you are a guest with us today. We'd love for you to take the tear off part of the bulletin and fill it out, drop it in the offering plate, put it in the, in the, either in the offering plate or out at the welcome center. That helps us get to know you a little bit better. Also, that's a great place to write prayer requests Anything at all that's on your heart, write it down, drop it in the offering plate, hand it to me, lay them up front, get them to us somehow so we can pray with you for the things that are on your heart. We do have some special prayer announcements today. This is the beginning of a new month, so our new prayer focus for the month of August, we have Deanna Oney and Kathy Gerber here who are going to share that with us. Before we share the new focus, um, we just want to encourage you to continue praying the Lord's Prayer at noon. And I just kind of felt led to share something that came to mind um, one day during my prayer time. Um, I just, I realized that since I had been intentional about praying the Lord's Prayer daily, that I had been asking for forgiveness for myself, but also forgiving others. And before in my prayer time, um, a lot of times I would not think to forgive others and it just it, it occurred to me that when we when we pray the lord's prayer there there is the part in there about forgiving those who trespass against you and so in um, scripture right underneath where it talks about the lord's prayer in matthew 6 14 and 15 it says for if you forgive other people when they sin against you your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins your father will not forgive your sins and also in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it just really became clear to me how important it is to ask forgiveness and to forgive others and that it's important to do it daily. And I just kind of thought about it as it's like taking a spiritual shower, just asking for, for a cleansing. And um, it also occurred to me that if we don't forgive, the sins just kind of build up and it can cause bitterness and resentment and before you know it you can start thinking negative thoughts and so it's just um it's just important and so i just we just encourage you to say the lord's prayer daily and and think about just asking forgiveness and forgiving others and i had been thinking about it and praying about it just to understand it a little deeper and i had the opportunity to talk to some ladies at a church in columbus last weekend and one of the ladies said that when we hold on to a record of wrongs and we don't forgive others or even if the record of wrongs is things that we have done and we're holding on to it it is like shoplifting and i didn't really quite understand until she went on to say that jesus paid the price for our sin he paid the ultimate price and so when we hold on to sin and we hold on to record of wrongs um, it's like we are stealing and so i had been thinking about that and just thinking that the commandment we're talking about today is thou shalt not steal and it just um it has a whole new meaning to me and so we just continue to ask you to encourage you to pray the lord's prayer daily and just go a little deeper and just take take more time as instead of just doing it um quickly and so we just thank you and kathy is going to share the new pro focus for this month good morning so the prayer focus for this month are, is schools. Uh, it's back to school season, right? So for the month of August, we're gonna focus on praying for schools, whether that's homeschooling, public and private schools, college and universities. We have a lot of our youth um, going to college for the first time or returning to college and then also technical schools as well. So when praying about the verses for, the, for this month, we really kept coming back to how important it is for um, students and the teachers and the staff to understand how deeply loved they are by God. So in the, on the seat backs in front of you, you have a bookmark, and it has a scripture on there um, 
Ephesians 13, 17 through 19, and it talks about um, being deeply rooted um, and established in love so that you can have the power of God through that and, and really realize that in your life. So we have those in the seat backs in front of you as a reminder. And for um, a requested $5 donation, we also have these keys for the kingdom, prayers for schools. <clears throat> and each little page in here has, it's filled with 40 powerful prayers and it's all directed towards a school. So it's a nice aid to focus your prayer around schools. We all know um, how important it, school safety is and that's um, a, a number one prayer for us as well. But please take time to think about the schools and every time that you see a bus go by, use that as your reminder to say a little prayer for all of the students, all of the teachers and the staff, whether it's homeschool or um, regular schools. Thank you. So always keeping in mind the prayer focus that we have for each and every month is, uh, is something that we appreciate and keeping our schools in our prayers for this month to come for a safe and, and, and good beginning to the school year and a completion for that school year too. We have some other ministry opportunities to share with you today. There's a lot of training opportunities coming up starting today and Wednesday. We have training sessions for our adult and youth small groups that will be starting up in the fall. The small group lead for God's sake will be our focus, so make sure that if you are, have any desire whatsoever or have ever thought about being a small group leader, join us today or Wednesday night for that training. Tomorrow night then, we're going to be doing training for, for our special needs, people who are willing to help with the respite night that's coming up in September for the parents of our special needs students. So if you would like to be here to be with those students, to give their parents a night off, that training is tomorrow night. Next Sunday, we're having training for anyone who would like to volunteer in our children's ministry back in the West End on Sunday mornings. So if you're interested in that training, that's next Sunday. Also, two weeks from today is Move Up Sunday. So that will be the Sunday that our children will all move up to their next class in Sunday school. So that's an exciting time for them. That's two weeks from today. And then also coming up on August the 17th will be another worship night back in the Student Life Center with Abe Kramer. So if you want to put the 17th down on your calendar, that's always a great evening of worship and of prayer and of celebration. So as you can tell, there's always lots of things going on. Make sure you take time to read your bulletin, check out the featured ministry table, see where God would plug you in to the ministries of this church. With that, I'm going to invite you to stand and greet the people around you and then stay standing for our opening hymn. Yeah. 
as we prepare for prayer, remembering that we can cast all of our burdens onto Christ, for he cares for us. Father God, you are an awesome God. And we do cast all of our cares upon you. And we do knock so that the door will be open. We seek that we might find. We come to you and we lift up the things to you in prayer that you have placed on our heart. Your word says we do not receive because we do not ask. But then he goes on and says, when we ask, we ask with the wrong motive, for the wrong reason. So, Father, we just come to you today and open our hearts and lay them before you. And we just want you to know that what we want, Father, in our lives more than anything is what you want. Father, we do have needs. We do have concerns. And we do bring them before we and you and lay them and say, Father, here are the people in my life who need help physically and pray for your healing. Here are the people in my life who need help emotionally and pray for their healing. Father, these are the people who you've put into my life who need help financially. And we lay them before you. Father, we come to you and we say, here are the people in my life who don't know you. And we give them to you, but we pray for opportunities to share your love with them, that they would see your love through our love. Father, we come to you today to say thank you. Thank you for the blessings that you continue to pour out on us. Father, thank you so much for things that you give that we don't deserve, things that we never expect. Father, we pray that our hearts will always look for the good. That we'll never say, he didn't give me anything, because, Father, you give abundantly to each of us. Father, we come to you today and we lift up missionaries around the world. We lift them up to you, Father, these men and women and families who have given their lives here to go to where you have called them, that they would share your love in that part of the world. Father, we pray for protection. We pray for boldness. We pray for peace. Father, we come to you, we lift up the persecuted church to you today. Father, we, we pray for those people who are in prison just because they worship you. Those who will put their lives on the line today just to share your love or to read your word or to pray to you. Father, we pray for the hearts of the leaders of our country. We pray that their focus, Father, would be on you. That, Father, they would understand that if they seek your word and your leadings, your guidance, that the truly your will would be done. And Father, that if you are for them, who could be against them? And Father, finally we come and we lift those folks who are not with us today, whether it's because they're sick, whether it's because they're traveling, and we lift them up to you. And we pray for your love and safety to surround them. Father, we thank you so much that we live in a country where we are free to come and worship together as a family today. And 
Father, most of all today, we thank you for your willingness to send your son Jesus to this earth. And Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your willingness to leave your throne in heaven when you knew what would happen once you got here. Yet you were willing to come. You were willing to be our example of living a perfect life. You were willing to take my sins upon you and take them to the cross. And you were willing to demonstrate to all that not even death, not even death can contain you. So Father, it is out of that love and that respect that we have for Jesus that we lift up to you the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. I do want to say if you are a guest with us today, please, your gift to us is being here to worship with us today. And we want to thank you again very much for that. We're blessed with special music with Bryce and Kalia today. So while they are singing, the ushers will take up the offering. Trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Would you join us?
So, Almighty God, we gather before you to give our gifts of praise and song and prayer and pray that you might take each and every one of them to move within us. Lord, that these gifts might reflect our desire to give, and that you might move us away from all those things that would hold us back or so easily entangle us. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, and we give in such a way that you might do great things, for we hope to see your kingdom built and all people to come to know your grace and your love and your truth. And so use us and all that we have to build your kingdom now until you might come again. For we give you thanks and praise for it and do it all in Christ's name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. If there are children who would like to head out to Lambs to learn about our blessed Savior, you're invited to do so this morning right out to the door over here on your right. As I see us making our way up and out this morning. How you doing? Good? All right. Uh, on the first Sunday of every other month, generally, we take communion together, a reminder of what it is that uh, Christ did for us on the cross, a reminder of that last supper, that final meal that Jesus would have with them, which was in itself a reminder of what God had done for his people in leading them out of Egypt. A little bit later on this morning in the message, we're going to talk about the commandments to not lie and to not steal. If there was anyone who knew what it was to be lied about, it was Christ. If there was anyone who had everything stolen from him, it was our Savior, who even while on the cross would have his clothes gambled away in front of him by the soldiers and for whom people would come by and spit and mock him and tell him that he didn't have the power to come down. Jesus understands what it is to be lied about and stolen from, and his response was not wrath and punishment. His response was to pray for their forgiveness. Even as Judas would join them in the upper room, Christ understood what was about to happen to him. As we think about our message this morning, my guess is most of you, uh, I hope, don't struggle 
with stealing or lying much. But probably the struggle for most of us is being lied about and stolen from. And so the challenge to follow Christ is not only what we don't do, it's how we respond. And so this morning as you receive that bread and the juice, know that it comes from the one who knows you perfectly, who knows the truth, who loves you regardless, and who offers you all things for whom worldly wealth is not the greatest concern, and for whom the greatest empathy flows for those who are persecuted or talked about or um, taken from. And so on the other side of that cross, Jesus would be resurrected to the greatest glory of all the cosmos and invite us to be a part of it. And so when he invites us to the bread and the juice, to that new covenant in his blood, It is not only for forgiveness, but to know his redemption. As Deanna shared earlier, to not steal from the Lord, to not hold back any of that forgiveness for others, as he has given it so graciously to us. And so this morning, all are invited to join us at the communion uh, time. When you come up, you'll come up to one of these four stations, invited to tear off a piece of the bread or get an individual uh, piece of bread or an individual cup or to dip that bread into the juice. You can stay at the kneeling rails and pray as you would like to or return back to your seats then. But in any way you do it, don't let it simply be a, a, a tradition. Don't let it simply be something you do and don't think about because the goal of worship is not simply to go through the motions but to truly let our heart be changed. And so as we prepare for communion, we are reminded that on that last night of Jesus' earthly ministry, he would sit with his disciples. He would take the bread of that Passover meal and bless it and break it, and he would give it to them and say, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when that supper was over, Jesus would take the cup When he had given thanks, he blessed it. And then he gave it to them, and he said, Take and drink from this, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Almighty God, now in remembrance of your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in union with Christ's offering for us that we might be a holy and living sacrifice that you might use us, transform us, that your Holy Spirit might have power to take us to be the sign and symbol of your kingdom here on this earth. Lord, as we partake of this bread and juice, help us to feel the invitation of Christ to sit at your table and to be a part of that great meal. Lord, invite us today to know your forgiveness for us. And Lord, fill us with such grace that we might know how to respond to those who sin against us, that in receiving and giving of your forgiveness, we might be further transformed into those who reflect your glory. We thank you for Christ who offered this meal first to us and invites us now to join with you, for we give you thanks and praise for all of these things. Bless this bread and juice to be for us, to be the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ would come again and we feast at his heavenly table where all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. I want to invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward. Once they're in place this morning, we're going to sing a hymn together, and uh, while we do that, you're invited to come forward to receive communion. Uh, If you're in the center, you're going to come to the center. If you're on the outside sections, you're going to go to the outside, and then everybody goes back into the middle. Uh, If you mess that up, we still love you. You'll just be going against the flow, (laughs) but that's all right. If you can't get up to uh, the front this morning, Steve is going to come around with uh, some bread and juice as well, and uh, all are invited to participate. i 
you. Lord, we thank you for the chance to partake together and pray that as we come to your meal, that we might be mindful of your presence, that not only the provision, but the provider might be worshiped and that you might be given full permission to be at work even within us, to transform us to be the people you desire us to be. So we give you thanks and praise this morning. We lift up those who are going to head off to school in a few weeks and pray a blessing upon them in all that they do. I ask you to watch over us now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart might be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. 
Uh, what beautiful, special music this morning. Thank you, Bryce and Kalia, for that today. Uh, a number of things going on. I, I'm always uh, mindful of being corrected when I say things wrong from the pulpit. A couple of weeks ago, I shared uh, that Neil and Janet Kinley are having an anniversary in two weeks, right, Neil? Is that right, Janet? All right, two weeks. So that's correct. You're going to have your 68th anniversary coming up. And so I looked to find out if anybody had more than that. Nobody said anything, but I heard Bertha and Ralph, have all, you've already had your 68th, so you're going to have your 69th anniversary coming up in January, so you're at 68 and a half, right? Anybody, anybody got more than, uh, uh, how, how, many, uh, how many anniversaries have you had? You've had 71, so a round of applause is appropriate. Yeah, so, man, a lot of great role models when we talk about uh, marriage, our rejoicing with all of you uh, in that. Uh, let's see, Abe Kramer, the worship night that we talk about for Abe is going to be down at the park, assuming there's going to be good weather, so uh, be sure to mark Abe's worship night on your calendar there for the 17th for that. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue with our sermon series on the Ten Commandments today. Uh, we're going to do two commandments because I want to get done before school starts. So I'm hoping you're going to be able to keep up today because we're going to do commandment number eight, which uh, says, you can read it with me, thou shalt not steal, and uh, number nine, which says, thou shalt not bear false witness, which means don't lie, right, especially in a court. It, it used to be in our country that you would uh, take a vow when you went to court on a Bible, uh, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Uh, that was sort of the foundation of our country. If you go to court, uh, they don't make you do that anymore, right? They just ask you if you're going to tell the truth. You say, yes, there's no Bible involved. Uh, without Scripture, without the Bible, a culture is lost. Uh, there's no reason for us in our own human nature to want to tell the truth. There's no reason in our own human nature not to want to take things that don't belong to us. Uh, if you go on a, uh, a mission trip, particularly in, in my experience down to Central America or down to Haiti, one of the first things that stands out to you is the, the fact that on a mission project, if nothing else has been done, the very first thing you do on a mission project is build a wall. Uh, you build a wall around whatever else you're going to be doing because there's no... There's not the same sort of respect for property and stuff. If you leave your stuff out, it's just going to be taken. Right? I'm amazed when you come back from a mission trip somewhere else, you realize in small ways just how rich you are where you live. And so we are blessed by God to be able to say, God, help us to continue to learn how to live with one another as we lose that we become more in danger, not just in a spiritual sense, but in a real and physical sense as well. I read a study this week that says uh, in the last year, one in six young Americans has stolen something. Like when they do the surveys with kids in school, uh, they find that, uh, that there's a lot of kids who've tried, who've experimented with stealing. It might look something like that, right? Right? When you're young, probably many of you when you were young had that moment where you experimented with this thought of what happens if I just take it? What happens if I want something and mom and dad say no or you know, there's a price tag on it and somebody comes along and says, well, let's just see what happens if I take it. And most of you then have the experience of getting caught in some way. Right? And that, that changes how you deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, taking things. Now, there are consequences when we break God's commandments. But there are even greater rewards when we learn how to deal with those commandments. Uh, to develop discipline at any age requires us to fight our desire for instant gratification it requires us to resist our first urge for self-preservation, right? The reason we steal is because we want something right away. We would like it right now, right? Have you ever 
you know, you go, uh, you go and you see something, you say, wow, I would really like that. I would like it right now. It doesn't matter if I don't have the 99 cents for that candy bar, I would like it right now, right? And pretty soon, have you ever had parents, you ever walk out of a store and you're unloading stuff into the car and then you discover there's something in your cart that you didn't pay for? Yeah, that's happened to me. You're like, how did that get in there? And somebody says, well, I just, I just took it. And you've got to demonstrate what it is to go back inside the store and to say, we took this and we need to pay for it. Or have you ever had been caught in a lie that you knew was going to get you into trouble? Right? And the easiest thing to do is to simply tell another lie to keep you out of trouble. Right? And you just keep telling lies until you're so far in you don't know what else to do. You want to save yourself. Right? It's, n- it's not an unusual reaction. But to, to know that we shouldn't steal, to know that we shouldn't bear false witness or lie, requires us to fight those desires, to say, God, make me a person who can wait for what I want. Make me a person who is more willing to stay committed to the truth than simply my own desire to stay out of trouble. Those are difficult things. Teaching them to our children is crucial. Teaching them to our society is part of the role of following God's laws. As we get ready to go back to school, even in a few weeks, it bears upon us to pray for our teachers and administrators and all of those who deal with our children. The law ultimately teaches us what we don't want to do. That is a good thing. Because once once the law is broken, it's hard to restore trust. The law, stealing and lying, are primarily about trust. My wife and I have very different ideas of trust levels. Partly because, can I tell you, praise God, as far as I know, I've never had anything stolen from me. Woohoo! That's not temptation, and that's just, I don't know what that is. That's, I did have, that's, my wife, on a church retreat, had her purse stolen. Yeah, that was bad. And then a few weeks later, a car dealership called up and said, You owe $15,000 for the car you bought. She said, I didn't buy a car. She said, well, they, you've, you've got your social security number and your driver's license and your address and everything. And pretty soon, we, we dealt with bills for about 10 years after that from these folks who had taken all of that information. Whoo, man. There's nothing more frustrating to me than when I go into my garage to get into my car, and in my garage, my car is locked. I am never prepared for it. My wife locks the car every time, everywhere we go. You, you don't blame her. Yeah. You, you can encourage my wife, Bertha. That's good. Because I get frustrated with it. Right? Once the law has been broken, trust is hard to restore. But to live as God's people, to obey the commandments, means we learn those things that we shouldn't do for the sake of all of us. But more than that, Christ then teaches us what we should do. Not only does the law teach us what not to do, Christ teaches us what we should do. And so as we look at Jesus and the Ten Commandments, I want to tell you this morning, I don't think Jesus would simply be satisfied if I said, now don't steal and don't lie. Because those are simply the starting points for how we should live. As Christians, not only should we not steal and not lie, it requires us to go a step farther. The Sermon on the Mount that we've been flipping to often in this series, Jesus deals with what I think are the antidotes to that desire to steal and that desire to lie. In Matthew 6.3, Jesus says, When you give to the needy, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, 
will reward you. And I find it amazing how similar stealing and giving are. In just that passage, the instructions about giving might sound an awful lot like instructions on how to steal. In those two verses, it says that we should do it in secret, we should do it for the needy, and we will get a reward. Those are the three things that happen there in those instructions. Uh, when, I, when I was in junior high, a friend and I went to a store together. And uh, while we were at the store together, we were looking at all sorts of stuff that we thought, wow, I would really like that. That would be awesome. If I could have that video game, I, would, that would, I could just keep myself busy all the time. There'd be nothing like asteroids to keep me busy. Right? And then we split up for a little bit, and my mom had driven us there. My mom said she would drive us back, so the time came to meet, and we, my friend wasn't there. He said, we, it's time to go. Where is he at? We walked the whole store. We couldn't find him. And finally, my mom went up to the manager. She said, I, I, I think I've lost a little boy. Right? And, and they said, oh, we have him back in security. He had, he had tried to flip the price tags on the video games and then tried to walk out, you know, and just pay like a dollar for a game that cost like $15 and they'd caught him. And there he was in the back room in tears because they said, we'll wait for your parents to come and get you. He said, my parents aren't going to come. They said, then you're not going to leave. It was, it was our first awareness of security cameras, right? And technology to keep you from stealing stuff. Uh, we we want to try to do our stealing in secret. God says we should try to do our giving in secret. That makes giving a little bit more exciting, doesn't it? Trying to say, how can I do it without anybody knowing? How can I, how can I give in ways that I'm not looking for the reward, I'm not looking for the, the honor? God, I just want to give because you've called me to give. Uh, God says uh, that we should give specifically for the needy. And when we steal things, generally we think we're the needy ones. And when we learn to give, we discover that in giving, we're the ones who are rich. The ability to give to the needy creates in us the sense that God has gifted us with things worth giving. And ultimately, at the end here, Jesus says, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It is the ultimate in delayed gratification. As followers of Christ, to come to believe that what we do here and now ultimately is seen by God and comes in some way with a reward for us when we do it. It is the opposite of stealing and yet, when we learn to give, we learn to move away from that habit of stealing from others. How about lying? Anybody ever been lied about? Have you ever been lied about? Anybody ever said anything to you that was not true? Let me tell you, I don't think it happens very often to our face, right? There are very few people who lie right to your face. Generally, you hear it from somebody else who says, well, I heard, oh, man. What do you do? What do you do with that? Right? I block you on Facebook. That's what I do with it. Just last night, just last night I read something from somebody talking about us. And I thought, Lord, that's not fair. I'm going to preach on forgiveness. And I'd like to be angry and write back something mean. So I blocked him on Facebook. I said, I can't, I can't take that. Right? I don't want, let, I don't want let that to to stir up my spirit. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 14, a verse that uh, Deanna quoted just earlier today. By the way, Deanna, I didn't talk about the scriptures we were using. I had no idea you were going to quote that scripture. Uh, Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's one of those verses that I think if you told most people that your forgiveness from God is dependent on your willingness to forgive others, they'd say, well, no, that's not true. I mean, that just doesn't seem to connect that, that I have to forgive other people in order for God to forgive me, and yet right there it is. 
that's a challenge. That's a challenge to us to figure out, God, how do I forgive people? Well, here's where I think lying and forgiving also seem very similar to each other. Do you know what it takes, I think, to really work through forgiving somebody? Oh, and this is hard. You've got to be willing to talk to the Lord about it. You've got to be willing to admit it. You've got to say, God, I am so angry at that person about what they said about me. You, you want to talk about it. You want to talk about it, right? That's why on, if you lie about people, once you hear what somebody says about you, you want to say, well, wait till I tell you about them. All right? it, just gets, it just gets worse, right? It all gets messy and complicated, and then you're on administrative leave, and you don't know what you're doing. That's a little Urban Meyer joke, by the way, right? The world gets all caught up in lies and gossips and problems and struggles. We want to talk about it. It's how most of our news media makes their living at the moment, by talking about things that may or may not be true. In order for us to work through forgiving others, we too have to talk. But our talking isn't to other people. Our talking becomes talking with the Lord. It has to be from the heart. When we choose to lie about other people, it comes generally from the heart. It comes from a, a place of bitterness or resentment or jealousy. And it hurts. For us to find forgiveness, I believe most of the time forgiveness is hard because we don't want to admit how much we've been hurt. Forgiveness doesn't come because we don't want to feel the hurt that comes with it. When we choose to talk to the Lord, when we choose to admit how much we've been hurt, it moves us to that place where we say, Lord, I know I need to forgive, but I've got to give you my hurt. I've got to give you my anger. I've got to talk about what's going on in order to get to that place. Because forgiving ultimately deals with our willingness to, to let go of others, right? Lying is usually about others, but forgiving is as well. One of the most uh, difficult stories of the New Testament is a story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? Ananias and Sapphira are a couple who we find in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, now you can go back and read uh, those verses on your own, but in summary, let me tell you, the church was at a place of perfection. Perfection. The Holy Spirit had come. Uh, there were thousands who were coming into the new church. Everyone gave as they could. The, there were no needy people among them. It's the kind of vision that we would want our church to look like. If you want to know what our church should look like, go read Acts 2 and 3 and 4. It is the moment of perfection in the church. It is the place where we desire to emulate and, and look like those earliest believers. But in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, who are a part of the community of believers, sell a piece of property. And after they sell their property, uh, they, have, they have made some sort of commitment where they've said, we're going to give all of it. We're given all of it. I don't know, maybe they were going to get a stained glass window. Ananias and Sapphira stained glass window because they gave all, the, I don't know exactly what it was that motivated them. But they said, we're going to give all of it. And so then they, then they decided, they said, well, let's not really give all of it. That's a lot. Let's give some of it and say we gave all of it because nobody will know. And so Ananias comes in first. He says, good news, Peter. Here's everything that we sold the property for. Peter says, are you sure? Here's what, you got to read it. I'm not quoting it directly, right? He says, are you sure? Ananias says, oh, yeah. He falls down dead. Yeah, that up your offerings. <laughs> so they carry him out. They bury him. Whew. Right? Three hours later, his wife comes in, Sapphira. She says, hey, did you get all that money? Peter says, did you really give all that money? She says, oh, yeah. And Peter says, listen, we just buried your husband. Now we're about to bury you. She falls down dead. It's the only instance that, that I can find in the New Testament of God's punishment, instant punishment, without the chance for repentance. It's the only story I can find in the, in the church where we have this sort of punishment scenario. 
I, I think it comes because in that moment of perfection in the church, like Adam and Eve in the garden, the loss of that perfection then would forever now impact the church. In the same way that Adam and Eve's fall impacts the rest of us, the rest of humanity, Ananias and Sapphira so affect the early church that it moves them from the place of perfection to where they, to where they can no longer fully trust each other. Part of the perfection we desire to return to, part of the Holy Spirit's sanctification in how we live is to return us to that place of trust in one another. And it has to start in the church, brothers and sisters. The Ten Commandments are written to God's people. Ananias and Sapphira are members of the church. This is not simply a struggle for those out there. It is still a struggle for us. How do we find the solution? If you're here this morning, you think, well, the truth is I do struggle with stealing. I do struggle with lying. The good news is that Christ offers us a change of heart. In John 14, 6, Jesus answers and says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The place where you want to be this morning is the place where God changes your heart to be a heart of giving, a heart of truthfulness, a heart that knows the way and the life. I hope you know the Ten Commandments. I hope you are committed to saying, God, I don't want to lie and I don't want to steal. Because Jesus died for the don'ts that we do, for those times where you've stolen, for those times where you lied, the penalty was paid. But Jesus asks us to live the do's with love. He died for our sins, but he rose that we might have life. Do you know the number one rated movie on the movie site, IMBD, if you want to look it up, is a movie made famous partly from scenes shot right here in Upper Sandusky. Right? Anybody know the movie? Shawshank Redemption. For those of you who don't know, uh, you know that it was shot here, you should. You should go up to the third floor in the courtroom and see the courtroom it was shot in or out to the, uh, the, the workhouse where it was shot or you should watch the scenes and look for familiar faces that you might recognize from 25 years ago. All right, that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. It's a whole movie about a man who was wrongly accused and ultimately sets himself free. And perhaps the most famous line of that show says this, spoken to him on the jail yard, get busy living or get busy dying. And in our world today and still in sinful hearts, it is easy for us to get busy dying in breaking the commandments and living lives that take us farther away from God and from others. But the opportunity, the offer for our redemption is to get busy living, giving, forgiving, that we might know the amazing grace that God has for us and that we might restore that trust that God desires us to have in our relationship with Him and in our relationship with one another. Let me pray for us. And so, God, I thank you this morning for our chance to come and to open your word. Lord, I pray that it might penetrate uh, every heart, that we might be challenged and confronted in those places where our sinful desires can overtake us. Lord, we pray that we might be dead to sin and alive to you. We pray in all of those places where we've been hurt, where someone has taken something from us or said something about us that wasn't true that we might give that to you, that we might be able to talk about it in such a way that our hearts are changed. Lord, that is a work that only you could do this morning. And so I pray that you might do a work now that, that we would say and know comes only from your spirit. For I give it to you this morning and do it all in Christ's name. And all God's people said, 
Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our final hymn this morning. As we do, I would tell you, as always, the altar rails are always open for prayer. If you ever get a DVD or video from us, it's uh, a lot to do with Don Stevens, who's upstairs every week turning on the TVs and running the cameras, and this week was his 80th birthday, so happy birthday, Don. Uh, the truth about all of us is that God loves us. May you carry that truth with you as you go, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace from this day forward until we all meet again. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.